Issue 174. We started with Uncle Chuck getting Sonic ready to be Antoine's best man, and Sonic Mother nags her son not to run because that could get his tuxedo all dusty. Sonic asks Tails if his own parents are that naggy, and Tails says, Worse! And that's why I love him. It makes sense he'd appreciate it as a novelty, if anything, since he just got parents, and sees their nagging as them showing how much they care about him and want what's best for him. He's not at the point where he could be tired of it yet. After Sonic and Tails have a brief joking interaction where Tails is complimented on how he looks in the tuxedo and Tails wishes he could have been with Fiona still, we then see Antoine with the Chaotix naturally having the pre-wedding date jigger, jitters. Sonic is surprised that Vector being the one giving advice, whether someone wants it or not, and Knuckles says the Espio went on mission alone, as usual since he's arrogant and will be back in time for the ceremony. This story's feeling so mundane so far. Like the Pender's 25 years later arc. Thank god the Egg Fleet's coming to make things interesting. We see Espio taking advantage of its invisibility and climbing skills to sneak through Eggman City and get in through a ventilation shaft. Sonic really wants something to do, naturally being the type to get bored easy, especially with the wedding. And after Rosie says he can convince Julie Sue she looks good in her dress, Sonic says, let's not ask for miracles here. Probably because she's a tomboy and hates any dress. Then Rosie decides to release Amy on him as a cruel joke, wanting to keep the flower girl entertained before the ceremony. I like that they actually point out, Aw, Rosie, that was cruel! As Bunny and Sally laugh. I thought Sally was her mother at first because she's wearing the beautiful tiara and that pretty dress and necklace. And the two basically look the same. It's actually lampshaded how when Bunny first showed up, she wanted to be Sally's hairstylist. And now Sally's being a hairstylist to her. They come full circle. Bunny and Sally have a sweet hug, which Sally endearingly seems to enjoy, and Rosie tells the two girls that she's proud of them both, and Sally gets teased about how she isn't perfectly happy being single. After Espio finds a battle armor in Eggman's base, it cuts away from the actually interesting thing happening to go back to before the wedding. Wow, Julie really doesn't look good in her dress, because it's not a good color, and with the things she's wearing around her hips, it doesn't look like a dress at all, but more like she's wearing a shirt and pants. Julie immediately said she doesn't plan on getting married because that required her to dress up even more. You can tell she's just a teenager. And then she has some interesting revelation on the Dark Legion culture for the first time in a long while by revealing that the Dark Legion never had wedding ceremonies, which sounds like bullshit to me. It's nice to see Sonic and Sally bickering over the fact that they're nothing alike. This doesn't happen nearly enough. Sally doesn't appreciate Sonic because he waits until the last second and calls him indolent, which forced me to look it up and find out it means lazy. Sonic? Lazy? Since when? And Sonic satisfyingly calls her out on being, and I quote, an obsessive compulsive worry wart. I'm impressed he actually said that and recognizes it. Why did these two ever get together again? They have nothing in common. And then Sonic calls her a prude. Okay, I'm sure that's true. She's an uptight, honor-bound princess and all. Which is why I don't see why she's called a tomboy when she doesn't go nearly far enough with that. So the word prude, it's kinda surprising to hear that. With the king in a wheelchair again because of the poison's effects, he and his wife talk about how they used to tease each other like that. And when Sally says they're not teasing, they really are insulting each other, Sonic naturally says, well I am. It's borderline treason otherwise. Good point. She is royalty after all. Elias says that the Crown thankfully recognizes Sonic's service, and he's almost like family to them. Then tells his parents to show up, with Elias thanking Amadeus for leading the Honor Guard for the ceremony, and Amadeus thanking Elias for performing the wedding. After Elias walks away, Amadeus promptly concerns me by saying, Soon you won't have much more power than that anyway. And Tails is rightfully creeped out. While I get what he's going for, absolute monarchy is a stupid dated concept just asking for corrupt rulers. But Elias is fine, he doesn't deserve to have his powers usurped, and Amadeus being all resentful, kind of plotting against them, comes out complete nowhere. Tails gives his mother the updated attendance list, and is given a vague explanation to his dad that's all sugarcoated by what he meant by that comment, and says that Espio's the one guy missing from the attendance list. Espio learns the truth of Eggman's plan, and despite his training, he panics when he gets spotted. Why didn't he have his invisibility on? Does it, like, cost so much energy that he'd pass out if he used it for too long? Because I never had a limit on it in Sonic Heroes. We cut away from that to see Bunny and Antoine boringly getting married with generic dialogue from Elias as Sally looks suppressed and not getting married herself. Espio runs from the lasers and, wait, did he just phase through a wall? 
He's supposed to have invisibility, not intangibility. At least it's much more acceptable for him having it than Sonic. And after Bunny and Antoine get married, Espio says, looking sympathetically afraid of Eggman, that the heroes will come and rescue him, and is taunted as he's sprayed with green goop that, that he hadn't read the report clearly. The story ends with Eggman with a green-looking metallic arm, reminding me of when he was an android, and therefore more of an actual threat, even without hiding behind his machines. Good, it's finally over. At least the character interactions are unique to the characters themselves, based on their histories, with them reminiscing about their past, so it's not like you could literally replace the entire cast with generic nobodies and have the exact same plot for the wedding. But it still feels way too mundane, to the point of reminding me very heavily of the 25 years later Pender's arc. And SBO's escapades are too vague with no real dialogue for me to make up for that. I guess that's my summary right there. This is an action series, you guys. I'm glad Antoine got married. There were heartwarming moments, but it was still boring. It was about as exciting as you'd expect a wedding to be. In the next story, which actually has me interested, Eggman is very disappointed to learn that there's no rings here for him to drill for, and he's just found a Chow Garden. Of course, he tries to settle for pointless destruction since he's a one-dimensional psycho, and the heroes fight his machine off, with Tails throwing Sonic in spin dash form at the machine, and then Knuckles and the Chow tossing the machine. Tails flies up to the machine and opens it up conveniently, and using his technology wiring skills. After he gets a signal, Sonic spin dashes off the cliff, and Knuckles makes him ricochet off the machine he's holding up, causing the drill machine to be sent into Eggman's airship. That's actually a pretty creative way of taking down the villain. Oh god, what terrible dialogue! Just look at this panel! Why are Sonic and Knuckles calling each other bad as a compliment anyways? They're talking like gangsters! And I wouldn't even expect this kind of shit dialogue from their evil twins, because their evil twins would know how lame this sounds. This is fourth comedy dialogue I expect from Sonic Boom. It's possibly one of the most, if not the most, cringeworthy dialogue in the comic. I hope the reboot when IDW isn't full of this. I heard it was nothing but bad jokes. Tails is spared the indignity of all this, and simply points out as the only sane man that the Chow Garden still got destroyed causing Sonic to relocate all the Chow, who fortunately managed to survive Eggman's attack to the Lycan Rings. It would make a good Chow Garden. W wait a minute. Nothing, nothing's gonna happen to Lycan Rings to destroy it and everything in it, right? Right? The story ends with Jewel spending a little too much time all attached to a Chow because it was roboticized just like he was, making me wonder why it's not working for Eggman and why the Bam didn't de-roboticize it. If that's supposed to be the first appearance of an Omel Child, then one, why aren't his eyes the right color, and two, where's the origin story for why he was built? It makes sense only on a surface level. So that was the second story. It really should have started the story arc here, and this was much more interesting than the first one, if only because of how creatively all three characters worked together to beat Eggman's airship, and how the Child Garden still got destroyed in a twist that still managed a happy ending. Well, is it happy? Is it always going to be happy? It's sad when the throwaway backup story is much more interesting and enjoyable than the mundanity of the main story. That horrible dialogue of one panel is the only really standout bad part, at least for me anyway.